Okay, um, so now it's your turn um, to uh, offer comments, questions uh, to the panelists, either all of them or one of them, or um, give your, your own commentary on what you've heard. Uh, vous pouvez uh, poser des questions et des, des commentaires en français ou en anglais, c'est votre choix, choix, mais sois bref parce qu'on on a beaucoup d'interventions, je pense, uh, et uh, peut-être on peut commencer avec um, des commentaires. Okay. Oh, merci. Sorry, um, sorry. Can you? Um, you have to. There's a lady behind you. If you can also use the microphone, um, uh, because with the, uh, I should let you know that this is all being taped, so you should know that uh, it's there for posterity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Mark Godson. I'm the retired law clerk of the Senate, and uh, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, very, very much for uh, what they've said today. I want them to know that they're certainly being heard. Uh, by my count, there were 19 senators uh, in the wow. audience, so you're speaking Fantastic. to your you. primary audience. I might also note that we had uh, with us the um, new acting clerk of the Senate, Mr. Charles Robert, so congratulations to Charles. I just want to touch on three subjects because the idea of this conference is to put ideas into the mill that people can run away with, and I, I have three reflections. The first was in reaction to um, your presentation. I'd invite people to go back to a bill that Senator Stratton, a conservative senator, introduced in the Senate and it was on the nominations process. And I think, if you think about what the Supreme Court of Canada said in uh, the latest decision, it said, you know, stay within the structures, go with the theme. And Senator Stratton's bill said, you know what, there's a section of the Constitution that says there shall be a body to advise the government in the government of Canada called the Privy Council. And his idea was is that the Privy Council should publish its criteria for how senators should be nominated, you know? Gender equality might be a lead item. Uh, you could have all kinds of others. How many lawyers do we want? How many accountants do we want? Uh, whatever the criteria are. And then nominations could be seen to respond to those criteria. That would be a form of legitimizing uh, nominations. The second thing I'd like to touch upon, and it touches upon what I consider to be an important omission in the Supreme Court of Canada decision, and it has to do with age. The Senate that I've served for a long time, that Senate was for the most part people who had had successful careers and who were in their second career. It was a body of mature individuals and that brought with it a certain culture and you can't write that down so you don't find it written but there's a culture in the institution that comes because of who the most of the nominees are. Have there been younger nominees? Yes, uh, the current speaker was one of them, a very successful one. There have been less successful ones too. There were also a few nominees at the very far end at the top uh, who were honor appointments. But mostly people were named and there was a reason and the reason was that nobody wanted to give somebody an appointment that went from age 30 to age 75. So governments were looking at naming people over 50 so that the term would be a reasonable term. Now, if you go to a term limit, the issue that nobody dealt with is what do you do if you have a term limit because you've eliminated the incentive to name people in the second part of their career. And knowing that money makes the world go round and thinking how political parties might think, they might say, and I'm inventing and caricaturing here, let's name 30 year olds. And they can pay their mortgages and have safe jobs and by the time they're 45, they're ready to run as politicians. And so you would have a junior Senate feeding a mature House of Commons rather than the Senate that we have of a Senate of sober second thought. So I think that any term limit needed to come with an age limit, you know, raise it to 50. And so that would be my second point. The third point, uh, I haven't seen it written anywhere. I'm going to speak from intuition. I haven't done the research myself. But the Senate functions on the same principle as all assemblies, which is majority minority. You know, the majority gets its way. You have your debate and whatever, but eventually you call a vote and the majority gets its way. But they've superimposed on the Senate from the beginning, I believe, the government opposition model. That's false for the Senate. The government doesn't rise and fall on a Senate vote.
but it feeds the culture of the institution. Senators are named, they come in, oh, I'm on the government side, oh, I'm on the opposition side. And it feeds their culture. And if you want to get away from that culture of government and opposition, maybe you need to get away from that vocabulary and that language. Maybe we need to get rid of the government opposition language and talk about majority and minority, which is the substrata. So those are the three points I'd like to th throw out for the audience's consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of getting as many uh, people uh, giving their views as, as possible, can we have another short commentary before I turn it over to the panel to address some of these issues? And again, please keep it short because uh, we do want to have as many people address these issues. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Can we go to Senator Eggleton? I didn't see you first. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Art Eggleton, uh, Senator from Toronto. Um, I, uh, I'm coming up to my 10th anniversary as a member of the Senate. That's a long period of time. Uh, but I must say, in this period of time, uh, I've seen things that I like and things that I don't particularly like. I like our work that we do in committees when we study items. Uh, a couple of you have mentioned it uh, previously, the studies on health care, the studies on poverty, the studies on agricultural issues, on aboriginals, and go on and on, where people have come together of different political parties and been able to work to bring people in who give testimony on, uh, on their expertise on different issues. We've been able to put all of this together, this evidence, put it together and come up with some excellent studies and excellent recommendations, some of which do find their way into government legislation, either in the short run or in the long run. But I think those have been particularly useful, I have found. And I've been somewhat surprised at just how easily it is to obtain unanimity on a lot of these studies, uh, regardless of the different political backgrounds. But the minute you come to government legislation, it's a whole different world with the same people. Yeah, you, you then get uh, uh, the government members uh, uh, strongly in defense of the, the, uh, uh, the, the legislation that's come forward. And even though you bring in a lot of expert people, it, it, it doesn't seem to register. It, the government members have decided what they want. They want to get through that piece of legislation. They're still involved in the caucus on the, with the House of Commons members. They work together with them. So, of course, they, they want to get it through. It, it gets to the point where it goes, it makes, uh, it, makes it ridiculous to, to talk about sober second thought because there isn't a lot of sober second thought from time to time that's being given. In fact, that, I guess, has been a, a, a pretty fair disappointment for me in the last few years because uh, since the current governing party, I'm trying not to use political labels because it could go the other way too, but since the current government uh, political party uh, got a majority uh, in the Senate, no government bill has been amended uh, in the Senate. In fact, we had the, uh, we had the recent uh, case where a government bill, uh, by their own admission, was flawed. By their own admission, mistakes have been made. But they didn't want the Senate to make any amendments because that would have meant you'd have to send it back to the House of Commons. Uh, and, well, they didn't want to get mixed into that time uh, situation. They wanted the government, they wanted their legislation passed now. And so even there, though there was an admission, even on the part of some of their members, that there was a flaw in the bill, well, we'll figure it out. We'll get it fixed some way. Well, that, that to me, uh, flies in the face of sober second thought. That is definitely, uh, I, I think, an unfortunate and disappointing uh, situation. So maybe uh, Justin Trudeau is right. Maybe we need to become uh, more independent and less partisan uh, as, a, uh, as a means of ensuring that sober second thought does prevail as it was originally intended to. Uh, but. Uh, then again, if Mr. Trudeau forms a government, he may have trouble getting some of his legislation through, or some other parties might as well. So I'd be interested in hearing what the panelists have to say about that dilemma as I see it. Thank you very much. I'm going to take those two questions together because they raise some of them, some of the issues are, are, are common. Um, if, for example, there is a, a, a new government, uh, what uh, I'm going to ask the panelists to, to put, take this into account when you're answering these questions. What will the procedure be, for example, where you have 
uh, a Senate with one party pol pol political uh, senators, a bunch of them, and the rest are independent or independent senators. What is the Senate procedures going to look like, and how can you instill exactly what the, the two <coughs> questioners have asked? How do you instill the nonpartisanship, which, as Stefan has said, is in the decision requiring a nonpartisan approach? Um, so, can any of you offer some examples or questions or solutions for that? Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at it first. I, I talk a little bit about the, what we understand by the term partisanship, and if by that you mean the automatic, immediate rejection of the ideas of your political opponents, then I'm against that. Uh, uh, I think that we should expect more, uh, a more constructive approach uh, to uh, partisan disagreements. There will always be bills and topics that come before the Senate that evoke partisan disagreements. But a lot of the work that's done in the Senate committees is in advance, in advance of legislation, and many of the bills are administrative in content. They're not the kind of, issue, of uh, subject matter that should evoke left-right debates or vegetarians versus cannibals or things like that just automatically. And I think uh, academics have an, a lot to answer for here, particularly in my field, political science. We haven't studied what the Senate does. We spent a lot of time pronouncing on what it should do and what, um, and it's easier. There's less work involved in that. All you're, you're just entitled to have your opinion and, and offer it. So I, uh, in response to both the former clerk of the Senate and Art Eagleton, uh, I think the Senate's influence is more subtle um, uh, indirect and longer term, and we haven't found qualitative research methods by which we might study that influence. And the committees are the, are most open to investigation from that standpoint. I did work in early in my uh, so academic career on commons committees, and I interviewed mem uh, public servants and ministers about how committees have influence. And there's a very underlying submerged process there that goes on that gets little notice. We have to understand that if we want to fix things to make Senate committees more influential, which they should be. They do good work already, just a question of um, having greater impact. Okay. Stefan, you had a question to comment? <coughs> oui, en réaction à la deuxième uh, question. Um, En droit, on a un concept euh, de base qui s'appelle la justiciabilité, savoir si une question peut essentiellement euh, être tranchée par l'organe judiciaire. Euh, puis en entendant la deuxième euh, intervention, je me suis euh, rappelé essentiellement que le fonctionnement actuel du Sénat ne peut pas, n'est pas justiciable, ne peut pas faire l'objet d'un examen par euh, un tribunal au Canada. Puis c'est probablement mieux comme ça parce que sur la base de Puis je veux dire quelque chose d'un peu provocateur, c'est pour ça qu'on est universitaire après tout. Euh, sur la base de plusieurs des extraits que j'utilisais ce matin, euh, d'ailleurs, euh, le fonctionnement actuel du Sénat du Canada euh, ne semblerait pas être constitutionnel. La question suivante, c'est de savoir est-ce qu'on peut réformer de façon judiciaire, puis la réponse courte, c'est non, justement parce qu'on ne pense pas la question initiale, la justiciabilité. Mais quand on voit, puis on en faisait un résumé tantôt, euh, que ce rôle premier du Sénat n'est pas rempli dans la, dans la façon qu'il fonctionne, qu'elle fonctionne notre chambre haute, mais à mon avis, les enseignements de la Cour suprême du Canada ne nous incitent non seulement à la réformer, mais à la rendre conforme à la Constitution du Canada. Est-ce que l'appareil judiciaire peut participer à ça plus que qu ce qu'elle a fait euh, le printemps dernier dans sa décision dans le renvoi de 2014? Probablement que la réponse est non. Thank you. Um, just to answer briefly the other question in terms of appointments, um, there's been several people coming up with different uh, ideas for how do you develop a nonpartisan approach. And perhaps I can, um, uh, whenever the time is appropriate, ask um, Mr. Dion to give his view. But essentially, uh, the, the problem is if you, if you have the Privy Council, for example, offering suggestions for that's still not truly independent because of the closeness with the PMO. For that reason, I'm not sure that would fly. Um, OK, we're going to take two more questions. Please be short, because we want to get as many people coming in. And give yes. your name and identity, too. So. My name is Helen Forsey. And uh, as a, a critic of something I had written, uh, pointed out some time ago, I am not a constitutional expert. He said she's, she's only the daughter of one. <laughs> but uh, so similarly, similarly, I'm not a senator. I'm only the daughter of one. 
and my father, Eugene Forsey. I, most people here probably know his name. Um, I have uh, been sort of dragged kicking and screaming into this, uh, this whole field ever since uh, so much nonsense started being talk talked recently about the Senate and the possibilities for reform. My father told the Bar Association in Halifax in 1985, there are two kinds of Senate, Senate reform proposal proposals, the possible and the impossible. And he said the impossible have as much chance of, of becoming, becoming reality as I have of becoming the Archbishop of Canterbury. So <clears throat> uh, based on all that's been happening around the Senate and mostly on the nonsense that's been talked, which has made me rather upset. I have gotten involved and started, uh, I, I have a book coming out in the spring called A People's Senate for Canada, Not a Pipe Dream. And I've had wonderful input from some of the, some of the senators here and I've quoted rather liberally from some of the academics here. And I want to express my gratitude for that, but also flag for people here and anyone else who might be interested that that book will be coming out in, in the spring, A People's Senate for Canada. And uh, it echoes a lot of what's been said here today and puts out some further, some further ideas. So um, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks to everybody here. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, I think um, Senator Fossey, uh, Eugene Fossey is, is a renowned hero for the Senate and always will be. Thank you. Um, Senator Smith? Well, I'm the other David Smith. <laughs> <laughs> um, just very briefly, uh, you know, when the current government was first elected, they were very keen on having a, an elected system, and they just sort of loved the U.S. system and more or less wanted it modeled after that. Now, why anyone would want that sort of gridlock that you have in Washington these days is kind of beyond me. And, of course, they did encourage provinces to hold elections and said that anybody that won an election they would appoint, and, in fact, that did happen in Alberta. But given the... I've always preferred the parliamentary system over the... Uh, checks and balances system, which these days in Washington just isn't really working. I'm uh, kind of uh, assuming public support for going that route is more or less gone, and I'm just wondering if I didn't hear anybody raise that point once today, and I suspect it's dead, but if any of you have any thoughts on whether that might ever come back, I'd be interested in the comments. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, I'm going to take uh, Senator Meredith's uh, question, too, as we just had um, um, a comment from um, uh, Mrs. Forsey. Se Senator Meredith? Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Sorry that I was my national caucus. And my other colleagues here uh, do not have a caucus, so they were here before me, but that's not some sign. But we're talking about, I mean, just to piggyback on my colleague, uh, Senator Smith, with respect to um, an elected Senate. and what your views are on that with respect to uh, visible minorities, um, the fourth African Canadian in 148 year history to be appointed to the Senate. My views on that is that if you have an elected Senate, we see the representation already of visible minorities in the, in the House of Commons. Um, I believe that in the upper chamber, that would be diminished considerably, <coughs> but I'd love to hear your views on that. Um, and then also the other point is, again, how do we act um, as an independent, fully independent body with respect to legislation that comes from the House of Commons, given our, our perspective on those legislation, uh, given the, 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 the thoughts that has to be going. My colleague, Senator Art Eggleton, talked about the fact that sometimes legislation are rushed and we don't give to the full consideration to those legislation. And I believe there's uh, an impact on behalf of Canadians when we have to then spend further dollars to correct things that should be corrected. Um, and so if we're going to truly be this independent body of looking at legislation and amending legislation, because that's what we're there for, uh, that in the past my four years, I've seen bills go through and uh, to, to great you know, restraint uh, on my part, um, you know, given my opinion, but yes, you're also governed by you know, your sort of partisanship and, and so forth and what the government is, is dictating. So love to hear your views on that in terms of how this chamber, mm -hmm. as we're all in this together, uh, about working on behalf of Canadians, because I think that's the end thing. We need to make sure that the end result is the bills that we put through in the upper house to be able, the upper chamber to uh, impact positive in the lives of Canadians, not cause more 
harm or difficulties later on to them. So love to hear your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Before I throw it open to the panel again to answer those two questions, um, this issue keeps on coming up. It started with Senator Eggleton, and now it's uh, obviously uh, uh, coming again. Um, and given the fact that, as uh, Professor Bolak has said and others have said, there's a clear message from the Supreme Court of Canada that the, the Senate should act as a nonpartisan body of sober second thought. Are there mechanisms through, and um, I'm addressing this to you particularly, Don, in, because I've seen some of your writings in this, mechanisms that in the future, perhaps not now, but after the election, for example, whereby senators can look at their standing orders and see how they can move from a, a, a partisan approach to, to reviewing legislation, including, for example, um, approaches to omnibus bills and, and the hope that perhaps you could have them split up. Is there something we can move, we can propose uh, to address these issues which are keep on coming up, that the court says it has to be nonpartisan, and yet we have this reality? Um, so that's to keep in mind. The other qu issue which um, Senator Smith has raised in terms of elected senator, let me give you my, my thoughts on it. It's dead. Uh, because of the Supreme Court of Canada ruling, unless you can get uh, virtual unanimity, and unless you can get um, a province like Quebec who probably would be dead against it, I think that's a dead issue, permanently. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Some years ago, I submitted a research grant proposal uh, asking a hypothetical question, which was, what would happen if a prime minister uh, tried to prorogue parliament uh, in uh, anticipation of a no-confidence vote? Uh, would the governor general you know, be obliged to, to accept? And the um, reviewers of the research grant said that this was such a outrageous fiction that it's not worth uh, <laughs> It was science fiction, not political science. I think was the, was the, was the sign that they was was the uh, remark. Uh, so things do happen that we don't expect to happen, um, and our constitution uh, is fundamentally based or is based fundamentally on a premise, which is that reasonable people will do reasonable things uh, and get the job done. Uh, and when that does not happen, and we seek to create structures to deal with people who are not being reasonable, then we have a much, much bigger problem on our hands. Um, and so w when, I, when I keep hearing the same basic argument that, um, you know, if, if, if there's a government of one party in the House and the Senate is dominated by another party, then we'll have gridlock. And it, it, that, that could happen. And people it wouldn't have happened 25 years ago or 40 years ago, perhaps, or, or not much. And maybe now it will. But that's a bigger problem if we're in that situation where people are, are not willing to be reasonable and figure things out. I have more confidence uh, in, the, in the behavior of, of senators uh, and in Parliament in general, and nor do I think we should fear conflict. Um, this is part of what I was saying earlier about not apologizing. Uh, uh, you know, we better not do X because of the, then people will be really angry and they'll take some mysterious measure Y that will be a problem. And, we don't know what those measures are. We don't know how people are going to react. Um, uh, and, and, and so therefore, to fear the, the conflict that might come out of hypothetical situations, I think, is a mistake. Uh, it, it, if, 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 that's, if the situation works out that way, then that's the way, it, the, the way it'll be, and, and we'll deal with it. Um, as far as the specific thing you asked me about, about the rules, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the work that I did in New Brunswick taught me something interesting about partisanship. One of the MLAs told me that um, if he said, if there weren't for a dress code, we'd wear team uniforms. Uh, he, 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 the, he, the, the point of being a partisan, I think someone else mentioned this earlier, uh, is, it's not something that is imposed on, on senators. It's something that, that, for the most part, they have lived with all their lives. They, they want to be in that, in that party and identify with that party. So there's not a lot you're going to do with the structures that's going to change that, that fundamental aspect of, of, of the way people think. Uh, it's to, it's the, the work that needs to be done is to ensure that that doesn't become such a dominating force that nothing else, get, nothing else gets done. But I don't, need to, I don't think it's going to ever go away simply by, by, by uh, um, a rule change. Um, but there are things that probably can be done uh, that can mitigate that. Uh, I like I like the the theory that is that is always being used, but I don't know whether it, anyone's ever tested to see whether it's true. Is that committees, and this is what, what Senator Eggleton was talking about earlier, the committees when they are working on their own in in the correct environment. Um, <coughs> tend to bond beyond partisan lines. 
and that and 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 that they're 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 able to overcome uh, certain divisions and come back with 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 worthwhile recommendations. That's an interesting theory. I, as I said, from a psychological standpoint, and I'm obviously not a psychologist. I don't know how much um, validity there is to that, but I suspect it's true. And I also suspect it's true that if you take people away from their environment and put them in other situations uh, where they are asked to work together, you know, in a public hearing in Calgary, that they are going to bond together in ways that they would not if, they, if they're, if they're, if they're in, in their own environment here. So I think those are simple measures that could actually take place that, that are not, they're not hard to do, which would mitigate some of the partisanship, but to suggest that we're ever going to get rid of it, I don't think that works with human nature at all. Any quick other uh, co comments to I, that question? I just question? have a couple comments, and one is my, th I have had a thesis for a long while that the whole business about a, an elected uh, upper chamber in Canada is really a, a Canadian sublimated Republican sentiment. It, it reappears, and it, it, it began back in the 1840s and 50s, it continues through to the present, but I think what an upper, an elected upper house is a conservative measure. I don't mean a party one. I mean it's a small c conservative. It runs totally counter to parliamentary government of our of the nature we have in this country, and that parliamentary government, it, its home is in the House of Commons. So the role then is for the House, the Senate, to figure out what, what its role is. And I think you can certainly have partisanism in the upper house. I mean I don't see how you wouldn't. I think it's partisanship, and I think the Canadian public would be very unhappy to see partisanship destroying work in the upper chamber if a such a scenario developed where that were to, were to happen. Uh, you cannot thwart the will of the House of Commons. If there's one principle of government, it's that the House of Commons is the voice of the people of Canada elected, and that trumps everything else. So the role of the Senate then is to, to moderate or to inform or elaborate it. But I, so I think it's extremely important. And all this business about electing the upper chamber, you can read the debates in Nova Scotia in the 1840s and 50s. You can read it in Upper Canada. And, and there's no basis for it. Yeah. Just very quickly yeah. before we very go Very quickly your... in response to Senator Meredith's uh, comment, I think there's confusion about who the Senate represents. Uh, some days of the week you're representing the governing party in the other place. Some days of the week you're a sort of proxy voice for provincial governments who have grievances towards the national government. But I think longer term with a different appointment process and people with more diverse backgrounds in the Senate, you should be representing provincial societies in all their diversity. And that hasn't been uh, sufficiently a focal point of our understanding of the representative role of the Senate. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take two questions, and again, please be brief because we, we've got people lining up already. So just first to you, could mention who you are and um, Thank your you, question. Thank you, Professor Mendez. Uh, my name is Adi Rao. I'm a first year student at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. And I do want to uh, take an opportunity to, to commend the, the, the University of Ottawa for putting this together. I think this has been a heck of a first year for, for, the, for my cohort. Anyway, we've seen the entire Supreme Court bench. We've met the UNHCR Special Representative of Canada. And now we have a whole bunch of senators in, in, uh, in the room with us today. Um, so thank you very much for this. Um, I do want to, uh, my, my question, actually, I wanted to ask uh, um, Professor uh, Bolak if uh, you would, wouldn't mind for those of us who are unfortunately unilingual or bilingual without French, uh, to, if you wouldn't mind going over the, the rule of law formulations table that you had briefly talked about, just in, in, in brief about what, what the central point of that was. I, I wasn't able to catch it, and if you don't mind, I would really appreciate you reiterating that. Uh, I was wondering also to the panel if you have any uh, research on countries, other countries with upper houses that you included in your, uh, in your uh, research on the Canadian Senate. And finally, on uh, Senator Eggleton's comments, I, I did want to bring this up as a, uh, as a topic that is of concern. I, I think uh, Senator Eggleton uh, really, really hit the nail uh, on the head, I think, that, that kind of encapsulates what young people also are feeling about, about the Senate in that I think something like 20% of uh, the Prime Minister's appointments to the Senate were failed Conservative candidates. Uh, and I think uh, and, you know, some, some uh, appointments to other boards were patronage appointments. So things like that, I think, uh, are also central to the, uh, uh, the campaign that the NDP is running called, the, I think, roll up the red carpet.ca. Uh, but I'm wondering, 
so in that context, what would your advice be to Mr. Mulcair and his campaign to abolish the Senate? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Balmer, say what? Uh... Merci. Bon. D'abord, uh, félicitations à vous tous pour vos présentations. C'était excellent. Uh, je voulais simplement retourner à la question uh, des règles. Euh, parce qu'on est actuellement dans une impasse, on sait euh, ce qu'on doit faire, on sait où on voudrait aller, mais c'est tout le processus qui est euh, dans l'impasse. On ne sait pas euh, comment euh, euh, sortir du nœud gordien euh, euh, de la petite euh, politique. Et en parlant des règles de comité, pour faire suite à ce que mon collègue euh, a parlé, que l'atmosphère était différente en comité, je me permets de suggérer, de vous poser la question, si en comité, parce qu'actuellement, les comités qui étudient les projets de loi euh, arrivent avec des rapports très peu étayés sur euh, les lois que l'on étudie. Et euh, si on avait un genre de template, des questions à répondre dans nos études en comité, à savoir, est-ce que les chances que le projet de loi soit inconstitutionnel sont fortes ou faibles? Est-ce que euh, le projet de loi respecte les conventions internationales? Est-ce que euh, les, euh, le projet de loi euh, fait des dommages à une province ou à un groupe professionnel donné? Si le comité, dans ses règlements, euh, avait à répondre à des questions comme ça, euh, moi, personnellement, je pense que ça serait difficile à ce moment-là d'agir de façon partisane, avec la petite partisanerie au moment du vote. Alors, euh, j'aimerais ça avoir votre commentaire euh, là-dessus. Et euh, si vous croyez que ça vaut la peine euh, d'être inclus dans un rapport, que, que le Sénat... Parce que le Sénat, pour se rebrander, c'est difficile de le faire par lui-même. Mais ça, c'est possiblement... C'est possible de le faire dans nos règlements. Alors, vos commentaires sont appréciés. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, just for um, the panelists who did not... Did, did you all understand the questions, though? No? Um, the, the question is, how can you... Uh, look at the, the rules in which the, the Senate operates and try and develop, if you like, actually, it was basically my question in a way, uh, develop uh, approaches to what the committees do that you could develop a sort of template where, for example, you could talk about, you know, issues such as does this legislation, you know, comply with the Charter? Have you studied whether it complies with the Charter? Have you studied whether it complies with international conventions, etc.? So could you come up with some sort of, je pense que c'est une forme d'état de droit framework, n'est-ce pas? You know, in a way. So, Stefan, maybe you want to answer that question too. But go ahead, yes. Um, I wasn't going to answer that. It was the, the young gentleman's question. He said, do you have information in your papers, whatever, what happens in other countries? And the phrase is Johnny McDonald's, but Senator Forsey used it many times. What happens in other countries with regard to upper chambers is apropos de rien. It doesn't matter what happens in other countries. What matters is what happens in Canada. Canada is a unique country, no country like it. And the institutions, as the Fathers of the Confederation recognized, had to be designed to deal with here. It doesn't matter what the French do or the Germans or the Americans, it's Canada. So I think it only complicates and confuses matters to look at the Australian upper house. The Australians have their own way of doing it. And Canada has, has its own way, and it's a fairly respectable way, but it, it can always stand some improvement. To any of you want to address the, the it's, I think it's a very interesting um, suggestion that um, Senator Belmer, it, are there ways in which we can structure committee work mm -hmm. which can promote nonpartisanship um, through templates, through some other types of uh, um, uh, rules, essentially? Let me get, disagree with David for once in my life. It's <laughs> got to happen sometime, and we're both getting to an age that we may, we may lose the opportunity. Uh, um, Yes, we should uh, not borrow indiscriminately from other countries, but are there no lessons to be drawn from the Australian model, particularly when we get down to the nuts and bolts of the way Senate committees uh, operate in the upper house in Australia? I did a lengthy study of Senate committee proceedings in the fall and the spring when each of the departmental committees that cover departments of government study the estimates. 
In Canada, uh, no, nobody does the supply process well. It's the weakest part of parliamentary government. The Senate does a noble job, or tries, through the National Finance Committee, but why not have more of the subject matter committees use fall sessions and spring session and intercession to investigate past policies and programs, see what's working, then get ahead of the minister and saying, here are some ideas. Ministers should be looking for ideas about how to improve programs. So, d careful borrowing. Do you agree there? <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you Stephan? No, no, no. no. Stephan? <laughs> Brièvement, deux, trois points. Um, premièrement, sur la uh, question de Madame la Sénatrice uh, Belmar, uh, je la comprends de de façon macro, euh, les projets de réforme, puis ceux beaucoup qui euh, attirent l'attention des médias, des universitaires, c'est une approche euh, top-down. Travailler à partir des, euh, des travaux concrètement, là, à la Chambre, en comité notamment, bien, ça serait participer à une réforme, puis je pense que ça devrait venir des deux directions, bottom-up. Oui. En essayant de montrer oui. comment, finalement, ça peut se faire sur le terrain, oui. euh, de concert, en respect avec, avec les grands principes. Euh, deux autres points, très brièvement. Euh, je ne traduis pas mes présentations en français en quelques « key points in English », parce que surtout quand on est jeune euh, universitaire à l'université euh, canadienne, euh, ça devrait être un, un incitateur d'apprendre la deuxième euh, langue officielle du pays pour notamment être en mesure de suivre les débats intellectuels. Euh, et euh, brièvement, sur euh, le point de monsieur, I, I, I would agree not to follow too strictly foreign models, but I think that we can extract uh, from their experiences uh, the validity and, and confirm oftentimes the validity of principles that, at least in the same Anglo-Saxon common law tradition, uh, is transversal. S'applique au Canada, en Nouvelle-Zélande, en Grande-Bretagne, évidemment. Aux États-Unis, peut-être moins. Mais n'empêche, il y a quand même des enseignements transversaux à tirer, je crois. Thank you. Before I go to the next two questions, I do uh, want to take advantage of the fact that Stéphane Dion missed his caucus meeting today to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and given the fact that the past, the <laughs> given the past uh, three questions have talked about, or, in, or sort of without actually going and saying it, what if there was, you know, another go government where you have the potential for um, the majority of senators to block the uh, legislation of the Senate. Um, do you have any um, ideas, responses to how, what would happen? And also, I know that um, yeah, feel free to talk about also your your favorite topic in terms of how to deal with the suggestion for an independent, nonpartisan appointment process. Uh, sure. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> I miss so much my Senate colleagues that I cannot uh, resist to be with you this morning. Uh, I, uh, I think I don't want to take too much time, so I will go right away to my own way to ask questions. Uh, assuming that we have a new government after the election and that the new government is liberal, then Mr. Trudeau has a commitment to fulfill. And his commitment is to come with a non-partisan selection process, okay? And what, after consulting a lot of my colleagues at university and their views, I think the main mean to go to there is to have a, an advisory board that we may call the Senatorial Advisory Council that would come with a, a short list to the Prime Minister. In order to be safe constitutionally, I think we'll all agree that then the Prime Minister must have the latitude to say no to the shortlist. Right. And to request another shortlist. Right. Until the time the Prime Minister is satisfied. Yeah. And when he's satisfied, he goes to the Governor General and we have a new Senator. So maybe my question to the experts of our panel is who should select the selectors? Okay? The second question, these selectors, I, all, I agree that senators may have a strong political past. It's not a problem. But the selectors, should have they refrained to be actively um, involved in politics in the last three or five years? I think it's what they do in UK. Or it should not be a criteria to choose the selectors. 
if you have a, a mix of conservative liberals and DP, it's not a problem that they have been uh, or they are still well involved in politics as electors of a non-partisan Senate. Uh, and my third question is, and then I disagree with Professor Thomas, I think this, this process would be completely safe as a status. It's my view. Because what the court said is certainly not that parliament cannot alone set the process to choose senators. What the court said is, in order to know if this process changed the nature of the Senate, we need to consider the whole process and not only the nomination uh, by the governor general at the advice of the prime minister. And the court was in the obligation to say that because Mr. Harper was arguing, his government was arguing, that as long as the senator is chosen by the governor general at the advice of the prime minister, whatever we do before will be constitutional. And the court said, no, if you change the nature of the Senate. The court did not say, I, you need to have the support of the provinces for any process you set. That's not true. The court only said, if you have a process to select senators, it should not change the nature of the Senate, which is, as all of you said, a subversion on top that is there to scrutinize the work of the House, but not to try to be the equal of the House. So these are my three questions. First, um, uh, who should select the selectors? Second, can the selectors be political? And third, is it possible to enact this by an act of parliament? Thank you. Um, I think because it addresses my paper, I'll, I'll address all three questions. On your first uh, question, I'm proposing in, my paper, in the paper which I'm going to publish in the National General Constitutional Law that we follow the example of the UN, uh, sorry, the UK um, <clears throat> uh, template, which is uh, through open competition, people's names get put forward under guidelines um, set by the Prime Minister in consultation with all the party leaders and, if necessary, all the, um, the, uh, the provincial leaders. Um, once those names come forward, um, there should be a completely independent uh, process, as in the United Kingdom, where, for example, you can have the advisory committee um, uh, on the, the orders of um, Canada review those, uh, those names to decide who should be on the committee. I'm suggesting four national members and three standby provincial and territorial members so that they can come in whenever there's a, a vacant seat. Um, so I'm pretty much following the UK model, although I have accepted that uh, we should not basically take the model completely because the House of Lords has a different template. Um, uh, the, the, the other questions that, that you had raised, um, I think the, the general consensus is that while past partisanship should not be uh, uh, a hindrance to people being considered for the Senate, I think the number one criteria should be understanding the complementary nature of the Senate to the House of Commons. And secondly, uh, being able to fulfill exactly what the Supreme Court of Canada said, which is the ability to exercise at least non party political partisanship to be able to to uh, scrutinize legislation as with sober second thought. I think that would be ideal. And ultimately, perhaps, if we have sufficient numbers of the independent appointed senators, I think that would eventually allow for a, a more nonpartisan uh, atmosphere in the, in the Senate. Going to your, your very specific question, I think, um, and you and I may disagree on this, I think we should avoid legislation at all costs. That could trigger a constitutional challenge. In the UK, the whole system was set up by, believe it or not, by a brochure of the, the, the Prime Minister's office. So I would recommend that if we're going to adopt this approach is to look at it uh, in terms of a uh, non-legislative executive action to set up this, this committee. Um, and it's proved to be quite uh, effective in the U UK, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't follow it then. I'm just going to take two more questions, um, and my, uh, my apologies, because I know I wanted to give you the, the, uh, the, um, the, the floor, because, but uh, I'm going to let the others also chime in on your questions, but let me take two more questions quickly and be very brief. Sorry, can Thank you. you. Senator McCoy. Thank I'm you. from Alberta, and I sit as an independent. And I may point out that that is a choice and it's a choice of every senator to do so. Years and years ago, decades ago, I was in, I think, first year law school as well, and one of my law professors shared an insight with us that has stayed all these many years, 50 or so, I 
thinking, could it be that long? Not quite. His phrase was, text without context is pretext. It's something that has stayed with me all these years. And I think it is hampering this discussion about the Senate. I think, Professor Smith, you alluded to this, and others have to some degree. What on earth does the Senate do? What is our role? We are not focusing on the full um, complexity and variety and differences of the many roles the Senate does play. We talk often about our legislative role, but that is only one of our roles. We have also a role undertaking studies of our own initiative, and that puts us into a whole different re re realm, if you like. We have also a role as ambassadors, um, parliamentary ambassadors, and on and on. Years ago, when I was a new senator, I coined the phrase, we are the only institution, federal institution, that is long range, long standing, long deep thinking uh, mandate. That is the Senate. And I said we're Canada's best think tank, which is a phrase that the Liberal Caucus adopted and put on its Liberal Caucus in the Senate, uh, put on its website. S senator so my McCoy, can, can my I comment then is, I would encourage you, and as you are developing your comments further for this uh, exercise, to begin to um, <clears throat> flesh out and put some um, more texture around that understanding of the multivarious roles of the Senate so that we can begin to then judge what activities and standards of behavior and, and, and procedures might be appropriate in each uh, role. Thank you, Senator. I, well, have a, I have a question, and then I want to introduce my colleague right behind me for a reason. My question is regarding the election of a speaker. We know that the conventions in the Senate are different from the conventions in the House of Commons. In the Senate, a senator is free to speak directly to another senator. In the House of Commons, that is absolutely forbidden for a member of parliament to speak directly to another member of parliament and must always go through the speaker. There are historical reasons for the difference. But what it says in the Senate is that we are 105 senators, equally each and every one of us, and collectively, singularly and collectively responsible. There is no one in charge of everyone else. There is 105. Senator, could you ask a question? Because we have a lineup of other questions. So the, my th question is, in rec recommending the election of a speaker in the Senate, has what, what will that, what are the ramifications if that were to go forward? Thank you, Senator. And finally, I, uh, Senator Ringette yeah, thank is you. behind yes. me. She has put forward in the Senate uh, an entire suggestion regarding how the Senate might operate in order to achieve at least its legislative role in a nonpartisan way, and I invite her to speak to that. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. What I'm going to do is actually get to you um, all of the questioners to give very brief questions because we're almost out of time, so go ahead and ask your questions and also brief briefly on, on your side too. Well, first of all, uh, I'm Senator Reggett from New Brunswick, and I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for your excellent presentation and bringing us to reflect. Um, I guess I want to, uh, uh, if, if Professor, if you will bear with, with me for, for Just a on the understanding that we have to get I out of here the, by 12.30. I think the essential question here has been asked by Professor Bolak, and that is, à rendre le Sénat conforme à la Constitution. Make the Senate uh, uh, 
conform. I don't know if that's the right uh, 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 to the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't say that in the Senate there shall be uh, a leader of the government and a leader of, of the opposition. It says that the Senate shall have four regions. And I guess that if we want to rethink about rebranding the Senate and how it should operate on behalf of the citizens of their region and their provinces, I think that is the question that we should strive to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting suggestion. Um, can you quickly give, ask your questions because we're going to try and get through all of them by 10 minutes. <laughs> Warren Newman, uh, not a senator, not a member of the House of Commons, but a uh, council in the uh, Quebec secession reference and in the uh, Senate reform references. Uh, so I only have questions, not, uh, not answers after um, after the opinions came out. Uh, very quickly then, in terms of questions, uh, my first is in relation to uh, Professor Smith's insistence on the notion of bicameralism, which I think most of us would share, of course, uh, and uh, the concern about um, comparative uh, constitutionalism was raised uh, by him as well. Uh, the US, Australia both have bicameral systems and yet the senates are elected how does that affect the notion of bicameralism or is it is it incompatible with parliamentarianism uh, given the australian experience um, why is it as well that five of the ten uh, provincial legislatures had bicameral uh, systems and abolished them rather than us moving to more bicameralism rather than less in the country is it only the federal principle on the question of electing the Senate Speaker, why is that more appropriate than electing senators themselves? And then finally, uh, on the advisory commissions, uh, the UK has a flexible constitution. We have a rigid constitution that is getting more rigid by the, by the day, what with con constitutional architecture now including the method of selection of senators. We don't have a similar provision in the constitution in relation to the method of judicial appointment does that have uh, an impact on our conclusions as to what may be done by statute or otherwise? Thank you. Thank you. And briefly, um, the, the remaining three uh, questions. Yes, my question has to is... Can you oh, uh, sorry, my name is Shaila Anwar. I'm a committee clerk uh, with the Senate. Um, my question is for the political scientists or request, I suppose, is um, if you can establish certain kinds of performance measures um, the traditional benchmarks that are always used in analyzing legislative bodies tends to be in the effectiveness of the institution in either adopting or rejecting legislation or amending or not amending legislation. The Senate as an advisory body certainly has a role to play there, but there are other ways, I think, that effectiveness could be measured that currently isn't happening or um, needs to happen in order to better explain what it is that the Senate does in the context of a bicameral parliament. And I think, Professor Thomas, you mentioned that political scientists haven't necessarily done a great job at that. So I'm asking if you can perhaps, uh, if you feel that there are effective performance measures that we currently aren't looking at. I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but not sort of hard data and how can we go about that and what kind of things would we look at? Thank you very much. Um, the last two. Hi, um, my name is Dana. I am a first year common law student at the University of Ottawa. And I just have a brief little question directed towards Professor Bolak. Donc, vous avez mentionné que la primauté du droit propose une nouvelle définition de la légitimité. Donc, dans une période où il semble que la perception publique de la légitimité est qu'elle ne peut pas être atteinte qu'à travers une élection, donc comment pourrait-on d'abord transformer la compréhension de cette légitimité, ce qui est tout engendré par la notion euh, du gouvernement responsable? Merci. Merci beaucoup. Et la dernière question? Euh, donc, moi, j'ai aussi une question pour euh, tous les panélistes. Euh, vous avez tous un peu discuté de la question des affiliations partisanes. Alors, je me demandais, selon vous, quel devrait être l'objectif Est-ce qu'on devrait viser à 
dans, notre, dans la réforme du Sénat, un Sénat parfaitement indépendant où il n'y aurait aucune affiliation partisane, où les décisions seraient totalement « evidence-based », ou est-ce qu'on devrait trouver plutôt euh, une solution un peu plus réaliste qui cherchait à représenter toutes les, euh, les opinions et les, les, les affiliations partisanes existantes sur la scène politique canadienne Merci. Et votre euh, identité Pardon. Euh, Je m'appelle Jasmine, je suis une étudiante en première année en commun de français. Uh, merci. OK. OK, so lots of questions there. Um, let me take the opportunity of just quickly answering Warren's question in terms of, uh, well, the advisory committees are not the same as in the uh, UK as in Canada. Um, I refer you to the preamble of our 67 constitution, which says that we, our constitution is based on the UK constitution. So if we can't have a similar type of advisory committee, I don't know what the meaning of that preamble is. So I, I disagree on whether or not uh, our constitution allow that. But I want to throw the floor open to anyone to answer the whole range of questions. Thank you. I'm going to start with the one why the provincial uh, assemblies the province is banished, what am I trying to say, dissolved their upper assemblies. Um, it's a fascinating history, and it's idiosyncratic. So each province did it for different reasons. Um, Prince Edward Island, by the way, collapsed theirs and elected them. So, so in New Brunswick, uh, Premier Blair uh, stacked the, uh, the um, Legislative Council with uh, people who would be inclined to abolish itself, and then they said, no, <laughs> like their job after all, so it took them forever to get, to get it done. Uh, Quebec was obviously very late in doing so, but there is another overarching reason why, um, uh, and if you look at the debates of that, especially in the, the uh, post-Confederation debates, uh, they saw the new federal system with the power of disallowance and reservation and so forth as functioning as the upper assembly would have in context of their own legislation, so no longer needed their own sober second thought. They had it now with Parliament of Canada, so it kind of replaced the, 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 the need for it. Um, some of the other questions. Um, I, I think, uh, Paul, maybe you can answer Senator Ringette's um, uh, very interesting suggestion, which I think is in your paper, that there should be some discussion as to separate out the Senate into the regional um, <clears throat> um, aspects of the Senate, right? Yes, the paper, there's some uh, content on that subject in the paper I did for the Ontario government back in 1992. That the Senate has talked a lot about its regional roles and hasn't organized itself as effectively as it should have to play that role. Uh, and you've shared with me your thoughts on doing away with the government opposition divisions, and that might bring forth more regionalism and so on. But the Senate, under pressure from government, is handling a greater volume of legislation, more complicated legislation, more pressures to get things done. So I think you're still going to have to have organization and coordination and all of that that goes on. I'll, I'll just say two other things. Uh, the idea is that um, we've got to come to terms with what the fundamental role of the Senate is within our overall political system. I, I'm afraid people and countries don't choose their institutions in that rational way. Let's sit down one Friday afternoon and, uh, and work all weekend and come up with uh, agreement on the roles of the Senate. We'd likely have multiple roles, and we'd face the obstacle we're not starting from scratch. If we had a clean slate, then you know six of us, the six of us up here, could agree by Monday, and we'd put it on the table, and the Governor General would approve it. But that's not the way it's going to work. So you're, you're hand handicapped a, a bit by the fact that people have attached expectations and attributes to the Senate. And finally, on the issue of uh, measuring the performance of the committee system, I think it's a worthy undertaking. Uh, the temptation for academics, social scientists, political scientists is to measure things where information is already available. So the Senate puts out a lot of data on how many committee meetings. It's almost all volume data, uh, how much activity they have engaged in. There's no attempt to measure impact, which is more interesting. What are the outcomes of all this busy work? Um, and that's very hard to get at. So um, uh, measures like how many bills were defeated, uh, modified, and so on, they're crude indicators. They're what I would call dumb data. They don't speak for themselves. They say different things. So we need more qualitative data, and that would involve interviewing senators, interviewing uh, Senate staff, uh, political staff serving senators, Senate clerks, uh, pro uh, ministers who may anticipate going to a Senate committee, they're going to get a rough ride, and th therefore they'll come along with a, a willingness to accept certain amendments in order to uh, with forestall a, a fight in the Senate side. Public servants, they come into the Senate. They used to tell me they like to go to the Senate. Now they tell me it's almost as bad as the Commons. It's become too dysfunctional. It's too partisan. 
But th that's the way you'd get at these sort of indirect, subtle forms of influence the Senate wields, uh, not in the way that you use a crude indicator like how many bills is it rejected, you know, since the uh, last great flood or something. Stéphane, est-ce que vous pourriez uh, oui, répondre? Oui, la question de savoir euh, ben, comment euh, concilier finalement la <coughs> compréhension contemporaine euh, de la gouvernance démocratique avec la suggestion de le mettre euh, en conformité avec les valeurs euh, du rule of law. Mais ça va être la réponse bête du prof qui va essentiellement suggérer qu'on ne peut pas réduire la gouvernance de nos démocraties constitutionnelles à un tweet de 140 caractères. Mmh. C'est complexe. Euh, puis de résumer à des sound bites comme le principe démocratique ou le méta-principe euh, de la primauté du droit, mais c'est juste le début de l'histoire. Ce n'est pas toute l'histoire. Euh, il faut essayer de justement, sans surcomplexifier les choses, mais quand même euh, avoir l'audace de traiter de ces questions de gouvernance avec tout le soin et tous les détails nécessaires. Thank you. Actually, I, I do want to add my final um, comment about Senator McCoy's um, uh, plea for more um, knowledge on what the Senate actually does. I think there's a missing panelist here. There's a missing panelist all the time when it talks about the Senate, and that's the media. The media has really uh, imposed tremendous damage on the Senate in terms of the characterization of how how senators work, how they operate, etc. And somehow, I think we have to try and bring that back into the discussion. How do you get the media to actually do a, a proper job in terms of finding out exactly what Senator McCoy has, has said, is to find out what, what we do, what you guys do, sorry, I should say. So with that, I want to turn over as a final word to um, Senator Joyel to, to thank everyone and um, say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mendes. I'll be very short. Um, first of all, of course, is to thank uh, the distinguished professors who have accepted our invitation to share their, the, the wealth of their experience and wisdom uh, in order to trigger the reflection, because as I suggested in my opening remarks, this is not a salon discussion whereby after that we are all happy and go back in our own respective world. Uh, this is, in fact, only the first step uh, to produce a reflection paper that will outline the essential parameters uh, that we should take into account in the further steps of renewal the institution. So uh, you have a commitment on our part uh, to get in the next month a resume of the presentation and the answers that have been given to the question in a format that would be, uh, I should say, users friendly uh, in other words, it will be organized in a way that we will uh, try to determine the essential parameters of the Supreme Court decision on the basis of what we have heard this morning. You will have also the essential elements of what are the, I should say, parameters into which the evolution of the institution uh, can be uh, determined. Because um, I have to tell you that as a practitioner, a daily practitioner of the Senate, there's already a reform in a way that has been uh, introduced in the Senate, which is uh, the, I should say, the abandonment of party discipline for a group of 32 senators. Because you have to make a distinction, as Professor uh, David Smith has said in his paper, between partisanship and party discipline. Uh, I am a member of the Liberal Party of Canada. I adhere to a certain number of general orientation, primacy of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the role of a government in establishing a better you know, society in terms of a distribution of wealth, uh, a better chance to give in to minorities to, you know, to find their place in a society. Uh, you know, and you can adhere to another set of, uh, of principles like the one of the Conservative Party or the one of the Socialist Party. They are all essential in a democratic debate. So you can adhere to, uh, to be a partisan in a way that you identify to a community of thinking on, on political line. But there is fundamental distinction with expecting the party discipline to tell me how to vote on a specific bill or how to restrain to introduce an amendment. What there has been a, achieved now with the decision to expel all of us from the caucus, that they have freed us from party discipline. I have 
no more constraints to vote the way I want to vote according to the party line. And this is to me a, a, a change, a, pot, a potential change in the Senate that is almost equivalent to a, a revolution for what I have lived uh, you know, uh, I sh I've been in the Senate 17 years, well, 16 years of my Senate life. Because before, if I didn't adhere to party line, after a couple of times, I could be expelled of the caucus and find myself exiled, you know, on the drifting of the political life. That was really the threat. Now it doesn't exist anymore. And the question is, you know, the Senate has evolved through the centuries and half of its history towards a group of people behaving, having to behave like elected people in the House of Commons, but not having the legitimacy of being elected. So we got the worst of both worlds. We were not elected, and we had to behave as if we would be elected. Now what has happened is that we're not elected, we don't have to behave like people who are elected. Hence, how do we move the system further to make sure that, as Professor uh, Bullock has said, how can we best build the institution on a legitimacy that is not essentially dependent about a democratic mandate? This is, in my opinion, the key question that we will have to reflect in the, in, you know, uh, with the contribution of, 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 the, uh, of the panelists that we have had this morning, how we can move the institution a step further in a way that it's going to gain that legitimacy you know, from Canadians. There is, of course, the appointment process that we have heard this morning you know, being another option possible. How that will be framed? Should it be in a statute? Should it be in the form of just a statement of objective? Well, you know, honorable, I was to say honorable senators, I, I am an admirer of the British way of doing things. A small step at a time and see how the system react and make another step. Unless you take it the very Cartesian way, Let's redefine the system in its whole, in its logic, and try to legislate that. I think that in terms of parliamentary experience of the British model, it's better to do a small step and readjust and move in another step than try to figure out in an overall system and try to imagine all the pros and cons and, and plug all the holes and find finally that it works, but not exactly the way we want it. I think that in terms of moving ahead, there is a lot of potential, and that might be uh, something we have not been insisting uh, that much this morning. I will conclude with that. As I mentioned in my opening remark, there is a lot written down in the Constitution, as the Supreme Court has interpreted in the, in the ruling. But there is even more that is not written. You know, the whole realm of, co of convention, the whole realm of practices, the realms of the rules, you know, that we adjust, we, ha we readjust continuously. Even the realm, of course, of, of, of parliament statutes, that is also a, poten a potential of changes. So I think that we have to be very practical. How, what can we do, you know, through the change of convention as we, we have seen, you know, through the decision of being expelled from the caucus, and I applauded it, as a matter of fact. I was for that, you know. It's difficult to be expelled after 25 years, like myself, of being policy chair of the Liberal Party of Quebec, you know. Day and night, out you go, thank you. We don't want to even to see you back in any party's activities, as if I had the plague, you know, well, and, or stole a, a million from, you know, the Bank of Canada. But, there we are with an opportunity. And are we going to seize that opportunity? This is, to me, an intelligent question to ask. And that's why we will reconvene again, certainly, in, in the months ahead, maybe to have a set of proposal 
options, you know, to discuss, to share common wisdom and common experience. And I want to thank certainly all of you from my colleagues from you know, the, the clerk of the Senate and, and the support people in the Senate and all of you who shared an interest in, in fact, in the democratic life of Canada because this is what it is at, at the end of it. And we are the master of that life. So thank you very much and thank you again and hope to see you at some time in the spring for a next step of this uh, thinking session that should uh, develop into practical initiative and improvement of our democratic life. Thank you, Honorable Senator. <laughs>